one and all. Warmest welcome to all of you on this lovely evening. I, Dr. Neelam Patel, welcome all of you on behalf of IMA Jalgao to the CME on the topic What I Do Yesterday, Today and Tomorrow. Let's cure not only crit. Hazre, Vice President of IMA Jalgao, to please come on the stage and set the tone for today's event. Thank you, sir. Now, with a great pleasure, I request our chief guest for today's CME, Dr. Charuhas Jagta, to take his place on stage and grace the stage. I request Dr. Pankaj Patil to escort Dr. Jagta to the stage. Please put your hands together for our chief guest who has graciously accepted our invitation to be with us today. Thank you, sir. Now, I would like to welcome Dr. Vilas Boe, Vice President of IMAMS, to grace this stage. Thank you, sir. I would also request Dr. Anita Boe, Secretary IMA Jaga, to please come on the stage and join the dignitaries on the dais. Thank you. I promise all of you that this will be a great evening for all of us as there will be enlightening insights and it will revolutionize our approach to the world I do. Before proceeding further, I request your IMA Secretary Dr. Anita Boe ma'am to please come forward for IMA prayer and salutation. Please stand up. Rather, our teacher, 
Dr. Charuha Jagtap sir in today's session. Dr. C.H. Jagtap, that's how we knew him since our second year MBBS. He used to take rounds in medicine wards and we did not have 20 wards. As ours was first batch of also Bhira Medical College and it was civil hospital. We did not have wards and even we did not have teachers also, but we were very fortunate enough to have wonderful great, uh, consultants and teachers from Dhuwe who taught us the subject after opening hours. Sir, I remember you used to teach us in casualty. ENT used to be smaller and isolated branch and it was like Kanna, Gasa and Dhuza of Basa. But Jagtap sir and Puranik sir simplified and glorified it over the years together. They developed the department of ENT so well, all the MS candidates used to prefer do it to learn surgeries. They taught us ENT exactly like storybook. In orders, like 9 to 10 p.m. after they finish their daily work, at night, in casualty, in blood bank, anywhere, anytime, they made us educated. Not only the medicine they taught us, but the, they nurtured our personalities too. I still remember, sir, you, you used to tell us, the book of Bhargav is just like Mills and Boone. You can read it while sleeping. And for your kind information, Mills and Bean Boons used to be a romantic, uh, romantic book series those days. But in reality, ENT is a tough subject if, if we really study well. Each of the sensory organ is so vast to study. If we go in depth, only ear can have at least five super specialities. Vertigo is one of the most common and neglected corner. So friends, it's my great pleasure to introduce distinguished ENT surgeon who is expert in treating vertigo. He has transformed countless lives till death. With the years of experience and commitment to patient care, he has become a leading authority in this field. Apart from basic qualifications in ENT from Vijay Medical College, he also gained International Vestibular Diploma in 2021. He is Certified Vestibular Specialist, which is Certificate Course in Assessment and Management of Vestibular Disorder. This course is studied in 2022. I would like to mention here that he started his state-of-art vertigo clinic in 2007 with all the modern investigations modalities. I salute to his dedication and passion for continuously updating his knowledge and equipments. The journey, the journey doesn't stop here. He is invited guest speaker and faculty in more than 20 conferences and CMEs. He, he has graciously owned the positions in state and national otorhinolaryngologist associations. He has played crucial role in MedCon and AMSCON organized in Dhuwe. He is ex-secretary -ex and ex-president IMA Dhuwe as well. He was associated with civil hospital Dhuwe since 1987. Later on, switched to SPH GMC Dhuwe and now ACPM as associate professor. He has astonishing organization skills and has organized many workshops and CMEs with national faculties. He never misses any of the conferences and he keeps himself updated by attending live surgical workshops of international faculties. And most importantly, he is actively participating in neuroautological updates for last 16 years consecutively. So friends, please join me in welcoming Dr. Charuha Jagtap sir and share his valuable insights on the vertigo yesterday, today and tomorrow. I request all the dignitaries to have their seat and continue Dr. Jagtap visit. Thank you for those kind words. She took me back in the 1989 days when the first batch was to get admission to Government Medical College to it. I distinctly remember what Anita has been mentioning, how difficult the times were in those days. And since it was the first batch, they had to go through a big ordeal. As you all know, the topic for today is vertigo, yesterday, today and tomorrow. And this topic has been 
selected by Dr. Anita. I asked her, Ki, what is the topic I should be talking on? Over the last so many years, we have had attending all the conferences on neuroautology since last two, so many years. Like in 2004, I started my journey in neuroautology when I went to Dr. Anibar Miswas. He was the only professor who used to deal with patients of neuroautology. That is what I know. It took me at least three or four years visiting him every year at his clinic. And I used to stay back for 15 days, 7 days every 6 months. And then he allowed me to start my clinic in 2007. Those were the days when vertigo was in the nascent stage in 2007. As we go ahead with the presentation, we will understand how vertigo has grown in the last two decades. Actually, Anita gave me a topic. Vertigo, the Alfred Hitchcock theory. I, I would have uh, loved to talk on that because Vertigo has been a mysterious thing for all of us. It took many years for the neurotology community to understand what are the basics of Vertigo and where we stand today. So let me begin my talk today. And uh, well, we have gone through all this because uh, she has made a mention of about my achievements so far. So these were the presentations and my achievements in this field. And I am proud to tell you these are my teachers, Professor Milin Kirtane and Professor Anil Mahmiswas. I had the opportunity to meet these two giants, Professor Klausen and Professor Gudeti. These were the people who simplified neurotology for us way back. Friends, the balance system is quintessential system for us to maintain posture. When something goes wrong in this system, the patient presents with rotatory vertigo, maybe with nausea or vomiting, blackouts, lightheadedness, swimming sensation in the head, swaying, unsteadiness, imbalance, motion sickness, panic attacks, drop attacks, fall or near falls. Why did I mention this? We can see these are various types of presentation the patient comes to us. But jehaa apan marathi bolto, ki maa patient apna gade yeto, ki maa patient ekas vakya bolto, maa chakkar yeti. Tala golgol firinani chakkar yeta se, tala blackouts ho dasti, tala glani yeta se, tala padla sarkha vata ta se, tacha dokya halka vata ta se. Yes, the glass symptoms are Marathi with the patient of Bella, Pratigra and the Taikas come to Marachakare. And then we are in a fix how to label this, how to categorize this. Let's see how we can go ahead. Barony Society is the society which is the apex body for neuroautologists. It is an interdisciplinary society that facilitates contact between scientists and clinicians involved in vestibular research. And this society has made an international classification of vestibular disorders. They first define what is dizziness and what is vertigo. So let us understand what it is. Dizziness is a non-specific term describing a range of sensations such as feeling faint, woozy, weak or unsteadiness. Patients describe it by various sensations such as lightheadedness, imbalance, illusory feelings of movement and disorientation. And what is what I know? It is a subtype of dizziness defined as an illusory sensation of motion either of the self or the surrounding in the absence of true motion. 
So this is the definition of vertigo. Friends, vertigo is a common complaint accounting for approximately 5% of patient services in general medicine. So all the physicians, day in and out, they are seeing patients of unsteadiness and vertigo. And about 15 to 20% of visits to otolaryngologists. In our OPD, in the ENT OPD, we see a lot of patients who are suffering from vertigo. But the main thing is vertigo is not a disease entity. It is an outcome of many pathological processes. Vertigo the symptom needs evaluation before we can initiate any therapy. Before we go ahead, let us ponder on these questions and at the end of the presentation, I believe most of these questions will be answered. I believe all of them will be answered. Let's go through these questions. A patient of vertigo is brought to us in our office. What should be our approach towards management? We use anti-vertigo drugs to stop the vertigo. Is it essential or it is, is it mandatory to use them in the combinations? We see most of the times one, two and three drugs are given in combination. But are they essential? Is it required to use these combinations for a prolonged period and in what indications? Do we know the indications in which we need to give them in one to three combinations and that to for a period of a month or more than that? Friends, what I go is a symptom. How important is it for us to know what is the etiology or cause? Before knowing the etiology, are we wanting to treat it? A patient comes with what I go with head movements. <coughs> is it always BPPV? Or is it generally of cervical origin? What drug will control what I go if it is due to BPPV or cervical cause? Long-term prescription of anti vertigo drugs and self-medication later is a common observation. I believe all of you must have seen this happen. Even if you stop writing, these patients go back to the chemist and they get the same drugs again and again and again and again. Is this responsible for dependence? Are they dependent on all these drugs? Are these drugs responsible for making them unsteady? We need to think over this. Why is vertigo recurrent in some patients and why it is not in some? This experience everyone has. There are so many patients who come back again and again with the vertigo, but there are a few who never come back with any. Oh my. Treatment with popular medicines like cinarizin, propylorperazin, dimethyldenate, beta histine, and others does it cure vertigo. Are investigations of help in achieving an etiological diagnosis in patients of vertigo? A relative or a friend makes a phone call. He has vertigo. What would be your approach? Which drug would you ask him to consume? Which and how long? Do we in any way contribute for associated fear, anxiety, panic, depression in all patients, in some patients of vertigo? Do our patients of vertigo deserve more than what they are offered today, especially the time and empathy? Patient visits you for vertigo. What comes to your mind as a cause of vertigo? Commonly, like we are all clinicians, we see what patients of vertigo. Have we given a thought key? Does this patient have any etiological cause of vertigo? How often have you resorted to two or three medicines in, to make the patient symptom free? We need to ask ourselves how many times we have used this. Do we all understand enough about vertigo? The scientists, researchers, and medical profession, all of us. Do we have the answer? Let's see how we do it. That brings me to the topic of today. Vertigo, what it was yesterday, vertigo, what it is today, and what we have in offering for tomorrow. I distinctly remember in the 1980s when we were PG students. The inner year for MBBS students were almost kept for option. Not many students were keen to know, not many teachers were keen to tell students what inner year is about and what, how it functions and how the ailments occur. The PG teaching also lacked. I have at least three or four colleagues of ENT from my batch 
Dr. Zamre, Dr. Kolambi. Though my dissertation was on inner ear, which made me think about all these things, my dissertation was carbogen therapy in the treatment of inner ear lesions. It was a very tricky topic, but then I could manage it. In those days, even the conferences were lacking any information about what I did. I distinctly remember one con conference. Professor Klausen was supposed to deliver a lecture on modern aspects of what I did. Everybody from the hall got up. They were towards the exit. Even the seniors were talking to each other like, Chalrek, after the lecture, kya karna hai, baad mein dena hai. That was the feeling, that was what we were thinking about in those days. Commonly, the cervical spine was blamed during those days. It was the cause of what I In the 90s, there were early strides in understanding what I know. When these two gentlemen, John Epley and Hal Magni and Kurthois, they brought to light some aspects of what I know. John Epley was the person who derived the Epley's manual for BPPV, and Hal Magni and Kurthois were the persons who gave us the head impulse test, which, was, which is one of the basic and important test we do today. In the last two decades, specifically I can tell you, maybe in the early 2005-2006 and then till 2025, the last 20 years, we have seen a lot of progress in understanding what is the etiopathogenesis of vertigo? How do we evaluate a patient of vertigo? And then the guidelines of management were given. We were blessed with the developments in computer graphics, software development, and high definition cameras. And this gave us all the equipment which we have today for the diagnosis of vertigo. The video frenzers, the nystagmography, the head impulse, the craniocarpography, posture graphy, and all the other equipments. I will show you the utility of all these equipments. This is the timeline of key updates. How updates happen every year? In the 2009, the Barony Society classified the vestibular symptoms. Like we saw the bizarre symptoms, and this was classified in 2009. 2012, vestibular migraine was like it came to light, and we got the diagnostic criteria for vestibular migraine. In 2015, we got the diagnostic criteria for Meniere's disease. So this is in the last few years, last eight or ten years, we are we have some clarified information regarding all this. 2015, BPPV. 2016, vestibular migraine. 2017, triple PD. 2017, bilateral vestibular pathy. 2019, we got the classification for types of nystagmus. 2019, orthostatic dizziness. 2019, rest by pathy. 2020, Mardi Department Syndrome. Vestibular migraine of childhood, superior semicircular carotid dehiscence, motion sickness, vestibular migraine, vascular vertigo, vestibular unilateral cervical dizziness. So you can understand, I have listed at least 10, 15 causes of vertigo because these are the causes of vertigo given by the Baronish Society. With all the latest guidelines from the apex body of neurotology, it becomes advisable and mandatory for all clinicians from all pathways to follow these guidelines and attempt to offer a diagnosis in all patients suffering from vertigo as a symptom. We can offer empirical treatment with anti-vertigo drugs in emergencies, but avoid prolonged usage. So today, what is the rational scientific approach to reach a diagnosis and demystify vertigo? As a clinician,
medical initiative from any faculty of medicine, we are likely to face a situation when a patient is brought to us with vertigo as the presenting symptom. The situation can be A, it's a very first episode of acute onset vertigo. B, it is acute vertigo, but the individual has had vertigo in the past. C, no vertigo at present, but the patient has files of so many clinicians he has visited. He has had many, many episodes of vertigo in the past. Multiple templates are followed by clinicians. There are various ways how to skin a cat. How to take history in patients of vertigo, how to approach a diagnosis. There are various authors, various books which are giving us the modalities how we can approach vertigo. We have the so stoned approach. What is this so so stoned approach? It's a mnemonic basically. So every word has a meaning. S is symptoms often for O. Since is S, trigger, autology, neurology, evolution and duration. So this is a mnemonic which is uh, coined for us to not to miss any points. We have a syndromic approach which is followed by some scientists where a syndrome is seen as a presentation and then we look for differential diagnosis in each syndrome so it makes life simple for us. And the symptomatic approach, this is the first approach which was brought to light where the history, clinical examination and investigations were uh, quantified according to the duration, the triggers and the target clinical examination was targeted at body. The syndromic approach, let's have a look at it. Looking at the complaints or presentation of the patients, we can categorize them in one of the groups. So there are seven groups in this uh, sy syndromic approach. The first is the first attack of prolonged vertigo. How do we categorize a patient in this? We, it's very simple. The patient is coming to you with acute vertigo and it is first attack. So how do we deal with it? Second, a patient who has got drop attacks. Third, it can be a momentary vertigo which is triggered by motion. So there could be any motion and then there is a trigger which is acting and causing vertigo. So it's a... Oh, oh. Predominant difficulty imbalance while walking. It's a big chunk of patients who come to us and tell us, I am swaying when I am standing or I am swaying when I am walking. Fifth, recurrent episodes of vertigo which is lasting for minutes to hours. <coughs> we get patients who tell us, I have a chakra, I have a chakra, I have a vomiting, I have a sweating, I have a chakra, I have a so these are the patients who fall in this fifth category. The sixth is chronically dizzy patients. Now these patients will come to you and tell Himala Rose Chakra. Rose. So there is no moment in their life when they are not dizzy. And the last is acute continuous persistent dizziness. So this is something new which the neurodiological community has found where the patient is hospitalized is being treated by clinicians from all faculty like endocrinologists, neurologists, nephrologists. Everyone is involved in managing these patients and they have some medical cause which makes them dizzy. Let's say we are facing a situation A. So we started with the syndromic approach and we saw that the first is acute vertigo and how to be managed. So it's a first episode of vertigo. This is very scary. So many physicians, so many general practitioners, so many patients who are admitted to the ICU. You can see this is a very scary situation. Presenting with vertigo, severe spinning sensation for last few hours, panic in the patients, relatives, everyone. 
and nausea, vomiting, sweating, fright and then this is classical acute vestibular syndrome. Looking at the complaints or presentation of the patient, no, no. For the pulse, if there is any arrhythmia noted, look for the blood pressure, look for consciousness, look for nystagmus, pupillary size, gait can be assessed as the patient walks into the chamber. Quick look at the cranial nerve functions. We are tuned to all this, looking at the third, fourth, all these nerves. Conduct hints exam. This is basic, we have to do. What is hints exam? Head impulse is HR. N is nystagmus, and then look for any skewed deviation. If you look at these three things, you can easily diagnose whether the patient is suffering from a central cause or a peripheral cause. This is what the basic thing we want, whether we want the neurologist to take over or whether we want to manage the patient. Any doubt of a central cause, we seek urgent neurological in opinion. Best thing is hospitalize the patient, observe, start IV fluids if the patient has been vomiting. Give antiemetic. The best thing we have been doing is giving injection prochlor by using that is semitil. If dimethyltryptamine is available, it is a very good drug. Add in the anxiety. The patient is very anxious. Who has got a whole diamond? So the best thing is give them diazepams or even or as a drug. It works wonders. <coughs> If we are suspecting vestibular neuritis, steroids are the mainstay of treatment. So give injection dexamethasone. Whatever the cause be, if you give dexamethasone, it's not going to harm the patient. Maintain stability of vital parameters and once the vomiting subsides, continue anti drug of your choice. I prefer a single molecule that is dimethyltryptamine, not in combination. It works wonders, one single drug is also enough. No other antiviral is warranted in combination. 25% of posterior fossa stroke can present as acute vestibular syndrome. So we have to be very guarded when we are making this diagnosis. As we all know, typical emergency department, 2.5% of cases could be cases of acute vestibular syndrome. And many observational studies have pointed out 25% of posterior fossa strokes can also present as ABS. In 38% of patients, vertigo could be the sole presenting symptom, so it's very important to differentiate central from peripheral. So these are the three things which come to our mind when a patient comes with acute vertigo. So that is what I was telling you, okay, when you go to syndromic approach, we think of the differential diagnosis in each syndrome. So in acute vertigo, it could be a posterior circulation stroke, it could be vestibular neuritis, it could be labyrinthine. How to distinguish between the three? Do cover and cover test. That is the hint test. Like you, the patient is sitting in front of you or lying down. If you just put your hand, look at the eye, immediately shift your hand to the other eye. If there is some deviation of the eye, it, said it easily means it is a central cause. If there is no deviation, you have eliminated one. Look for dangerous these. We have been taught this. Duplopia, dysarthria, dysphoria. If it is there, it is definitely a central cause. Nystagmus, if we just see, if it is non fatigable, it goes towards center. If it is fatigable, we can think of a peripheral cause. It can be a direction, direction changing nystagmus. If we can do the smooth pursuit and saccades test, we can easily pinpoint the abnormalities. We are separation. So all these tests can be done bedside. I can assure you, if you just follow this protocol, within five minutes to seven minutes, you can easily make out whether we are dealing with a peripheral cause or a central cause. 
if you have come across, uh, if you have thought about vascular neuritis, there is no central cause. There are no dangerous knees. The hearing is preserved. Nystagmus is direction fixed. It doesn't change direction, you know, vascular neuritis. And it reduces some fixation. If you ask the patient to look at the finger, the nystagmus will start fatiguing. So that is peripheral cause. And in that labyrinthitis, it is associated with hearing loss and tinnitus. So we have differentiated three causes within five minutes without going sending the patient for an MRI. MRI generally in this time is inconclusive in strokes. All my physician friends, neurologist friends will agree with this. Doing an MRI in first six hours, three hours, four hours, first day, generally it is negative. The physicians will agree with this, neurologists will agree. The MRIs generally become conclusive only after 48 hours. So this is the proforma we follow. This proforma is available everywhere and we can't miss any points so that we can easily manage a patient of acute poor time. Next. Next. Let's go to the second group of symptom. And this is momentary vertigo triggered by motion. The cluster itself is mean, it has a meaning. Momentary vertigo. It, it lasts within few seconds to minutes and it is always triggered by motion. So what falls as a differential diagnosis in this category? Number one is obviously BPPB. BPPB we all should understand. Let me just give you a small example when we talk about BPPB. What is BPPB basically? We should understand the physics and pathophysiology of BPPB. BPPB is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. It is benign. It appears in paroxysms. It is positional. Okay? So these three factors have to be there. Now, just imagine, put your fingers, all of you, in front. Now we are looking at the finger. Now move your head. When we are moving the head, our vision is still stable. And we are looking at the finger. How does this happen? This is because of the semicircular canals. So when we are looking at an object, and if we are moving the head, even then the object is in under in our vision and it is stable. This is because of the semicircular. So when we ask functions of semicircular canal, what is the function of semicircular canal? In the past, we were told keep maintaining balance is the function of semicircular canals. But maintaining stable vision is the first function of semicircular canals. And this is vestibular ocular reflex. This is the basis. This is the basis. So what happens is when we are focusing our attention on a finger and we are moving the head, the cupola inside the lateral semicircular canal is set into motion. The fluid inside the semicircular canal moves and the cupola is set into motion and it gives formation of impulses which is conducted to the vestibular nerve. And the vestibular nerve sends the impulses to the ocular muscles. So the eye moves accordingly. So if I am moving my head to the left, the eyes will move to the right. So there is always opposite movement in the eyes when we are looking or focusing or stabilizing our vision. You may try any time. If, if you look on the other side, you can see the eye will move also on the opposite side. If you look up, down. So the eye will always move on the opposite side. So this is the function of the semicircular canal. What exactly goes wrong in PPPB? We know we have three semicircular canals and the two autolithic organs, the utricle and saccule. The utricle has a bed on which we have autoconia. These are heavy particles, these are calcium crystals. And because of some illness, maybe trauma, infection, whatever, these autoconia, if they get dislodged, they come and they start floating in the whole labyrinth. 
Now these autogonia, if they go into the lateral semicircular canal or they go into the posterior semicircular canal, because of the gravity of these autogonia, the equilibrium in the semicircular canals is changed. The fluid in the semicircular canal will always have some effect because of this autogonia. And because these heavy particles, they tend to move when we change head position. So if I am lying down and if I sit, the particles in the semicircular canals will move and give a sensation of movement in the fluid up, and there will be cupular stimulation. There will be vestibular nerve stimulation and then the eyes will start moving again. So this is what we have been seeing when we focus on a finger. <clears throat> so these particles will cause movement of the eyeballs and that is nystagmus. And this nystagmus which is caused because of the cupula movement, because of the floating particles in the semicircular canals is nothing but BPPV. This is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. And then we have so many subtypes of BPPV now, which we have recognized over the years, but the common is this posterior semicircular canal BPPV. The other thing which mimics BPPV is <coughs> RVAOS, that is rotational vertebral artery occlusion syndrome. How this can happen? If a person has got a hypoplastic vertebral artery on one side or a stenotic vertebral artery on one side and on the other side it is compensatory, it has compensated and it has become bigger. Now if you, if the patient turns the head on the side of the, comp, uh, the stenosed vertebral artery, there will be more occlusion on the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, if, we, if the patient turns the head on the side which has got a normal vertebral artery, this is a rotational vertebral artery syndrome. So it is again vertigo which is triggered by motion. But we can diagnose this. Orthostatic hypotension is something which we are diagnosing day in and out because we have a protocol in our clinic when every patient of vertigo starts his workup or her workup, we do four readings of blood pressure. The patient is lying supine, the patient is standing, 15 seconds we do the recording, Three minutes, the patient is standing, we do the recording. Eight minutes, we do the recording. And we have found so many patients of orthostatic hypotension. Old vestibular deficits. So, if I had a vestibular neuritis in the past, and I have not compensated well, so every time I make a head movement, I will feel dizzy. So this is again dizziness secondary to triggered by motion. Arnold Chiari malformation, when we have the cellular peduncles getting compressed into the foramen. Superior semicircular canal diseases, this is something new. It is a third window syndrome. Like we know in the inner ear, we have got two windows, the over window and the round window. So if there is any new window formation in the labyrinth, so that becomes the third window. And we now have understood that migraine and posteriofossal lesions can also cause momentary vertigo. Let's go to the third syndrome. So we found two things. First was the acute uh, vestibular syndrome. Second, we saw vertigo which is momentary, which is triggered by motion. And now we have the third group that is drop attacks. These are the patients who tend to fall or near fall or fall. But the patient is fully conscious when the patient suddenly loses muscle tone and collapses to the ground. In ENT, the first thing that comes to our mind is Tumarkin's autolithic crisis. This is a typical presentation of the patient who has got meniers for years together and has got an end state meniers, comes to us and tells us he falls down without any knowledge and he injures himself, he gets injuries to the limbs and Cataplexy is something we have, which comes to our mind if the patient gives a history of drop attacks. TIAs of the spinal cord, TIAs of the anterior cerebral artery, progressive supranuclear palsy. 
cardiogenic or neurological falls. But cardiogenic or neurological falls are generally associated with some amount of unconsciousness or uh, change. Next. The fourth group could be recurrent episodes of vertigo, lasting from minutes to hours. These are the patients who classically tell us that the vertigo when it occurs starts uh, lasts for 30 minutes, one hour, one and a half hour, two hours. And the diagnosis which come to our mind is vestibular migraine, menias disease, episodic ataxias or TIAs. This is the fifth group where the patient tells us he, difficult, he finds difficulty in walking and standing. And the differential diagnosis which comes to our mind is either it is peripheral neuropathies or bilateral vestibulopathy or it could be a central cause where we have neurological gait issues. The sixth group is chronic disease patients. The number of these patients is increasing day by day, day by day, because we know, we understand how this has been happening. It was and has been described as chronic subjective deafness or phobic postural vertigo. Recently, the Baroness Society has coined a term for this, persistent postural perceptive dizziness. Next. And this is the last group where acute, persistent and continuous dizziness is seen and this is purely medical reason where it could be electrolyte imbalance, medical renal disease, thyroid, liver function, dysfunction or vitamin deficiencies. This is the figure from all clinics all over the world. Neurology clinics have a database, even I am maintaining a database in my clinic this is the frequency of different vertigo syndromes in clinics. We have a database of almost 3,000 patients in our clinic right now. The commonest cause is vestibular migraine nowadays, almost 31 patients, 31%. Menias disease, 19%. Central vertigo, 14%. BPPV, 13 Vestibular neuritis or labyrinthitis, 8%. And triple PD, 7%. Why I have mentioned this is, if you read the bottom line, the top six constitute almost 92% of the causes of patients of vertigo. It definitely means we have to understand the top six and diagnose them and manage them. The other causes are bilateral vestibulopathy, paroxysmias, parallel fistulas, and unknown vertigo symptoms. To reach diagnosis in a vertigo, we have an algorithmic clinical approach with the help of modern day vestibulometric tests. We have a set of questions to help us differentiate various causes of true vertigo. Let's have a look at that. The differential diagnosis can be achieved by three methods. Number one, history taking, clinical examination and investigations. History taking is of prime importance. If you spend time with the patient, the patient is keen to give you a diagnosis. The only thing is time. We need to have time with these patients. In almost 80 to 85% individuals, a tentative diagnosis can be reached by proper history. Listen very carefully what the patient has to say. Let's see how these questions can guide us. Onset time, course, and length of the attack. We saw so many syndromes and then you can easily think what the patient is telling us. Does the head motion inside or aggravate vertigo? Are there any associated cochlear symptoms? Is there any hearing loss, tinnitus or association, uh, associated oral fullness that is seen in menials? Are these exaggerated when the dizziness is worse? Was there any antecedent head injury? Head injury, post-concussional dizziness causes uh, it's a big chunk of patients who come to us. Is it associated with headache? It could lead us to vestibular migraine. Are there any neurological symptoms? Is there any history of drug or psychiatric illness? Yes, it gives us a glimpse. It could be momentary. It is a sequel of unilateral vestibular failure. For a few seconds, if it is lasting, it could be BPPV or epileptic vertigo. If it is lasting for a few minutes, it could be from 2 to 20 minutes, it could be a TIA, it could be a syncopal or a presyncopal attack, or it can be a perilent fistula. If it is a hours, it could be Meniere's disease or vestibular migraine. We can start thinking about a diagnosis the moment the patient gives us a history, what it is. 
If it is between days, two days, seven days, it could be vestibular neuritis, labyrinthitis. If it is more than three days, it could be a central nervous cause. And if it goes on for weeks, it could be a psychiatric cause or a CNS leak. So these could be the precipitating factors. Turning on one side, think of BPP. Suddenly sitting up, it could be orthostatic hypotension. Rapid head movements causing, it could be a defective VOR. Only while walking, it could be Parkinson's or cerebellar cause. Coughing, sneezing, causing vertigo, think of perineum fissures. Loud sounds causing vertigo, it could be a Tulio phenomenon. If it's emotional, it could be a psychogenic vertigo. Viral infections, neuritis. So these are precipitating factors which give us a diagnosis. Next. So after a brief neurological examination, which we are tuned to, we look for the cranial nerves, third, fourth, fifth, corneal reflex, six, seven, eight, knee jerk, ankle jerk, plantar response, motor and sensory system examination, and neck movements. We proceed to vestibular spinal test and vestibular ocular test. Very simple. It doesn't take more than a minute or two to do this test. The standing test is Romberg's test, the stepping test is Arnold's test, and the cerebellar test is the tandem gate. The vestibular ocular test we look for spontaneous nystagmus or any abnormal eye movements in the eye. We look for gaze nystagmus. We ask the patient to look on the sides and if there is a nystagmus that is precipitated, it will give us a clue. We do the positional and positioning test and the head shaking test. But the most important concern is where does vertigo come from? We have to know whether it is from the ear or brain. So how do we differentiate peripheral from the central causes? We take the help of modern day vestibulometry. What is so special about modern day vestibulometry? With the technology available now, the exact site of lesion can be diagnosed and the nature of pathology also can be diagnosed with precision. Treatment today is directed towards treating the cause and not camouflaging the symptoms of vertigo by vestibular sedatives. Whatever drug you give for vertigo, we all know which drugs we prescribe and take it from here. All of them are vestibular sedatives. So vestibulometry is a key to precise diagnosis. What is so special about it? Today patients are aware of how rationally their problem is being managed by the clinician. I'll give you so many examples how the patients have approached me, how they are aware of it. I just got a recent thing. Huh, Manoj was telling me about a patient. The patient went to onto the neck and then found the ENT can be a cause for what I want. Then the patient approached him. So this is what is happening day in and out. The clinician is morally and legally bound today to offer the latest diagnostic technology to the patient. Non-availability of the requisite diagnostic equipment or lack of infrastructure is no alibi for misdiagnosis. Tomorrow our patients are going to ask us, I am having what I know. I need to be attended very well. So this is the armamentarium we have. These are the vestibular function tests which we can do. These all are available in my clinic under one roof. The video presence, video oculography, Subjective visual vertical, video head impulse test, functional head impulse test, posturography, craniocarpography, the audiometries, the brain semi response audiometries, the electrocochleography, ocular vamp and cervical vamp. So, all these things, when we have in our armamentarium, almost be sure you will be able to diagnose unless there are some tricky situations where the diagnosis is still difficult with all these things. What is evaluated in this test? It is important for all of us to understand what comprises about the balance system. <coughs> the vestibular labyrinth consisting of the three semicircular canals, the utricle and saccule, vestibular nerve, the superior and inferior nerves, Vestibular nucleus, brain stem, cerebellum, vestibular cortex, eyes, spinal cord, peripheral nerves, skeletal and extraocular muscles. Knowledge of all these basic structure and function of the vestibular system is essential to assess and manage the patient of vertigo and balance. 
this is, we are all familiar with this. You can see the receptor canals, the cochlea, and the vesicular nerve. The balance is maintained with inputs from the eyes, from the ears, and the proprioceptive feedback from the skin and the joints. This is video forensics examination. We have got forensics goggles where we can see a magnified image on the monitor and we can easily diagnose eyeball movements and diagnose what type of nystagmus the patient has got. This can be a substitute to video forensics. We can have forensics goggles, which are, these are available on Amazon also. This is very simple. Every person, every clinician can have this. It's a pair of specs with 20 diopter glasses. Any, cl any clinician can have this from the optometrist. Next. This is very, very important. Video nystagmography or video oculography. For all our patients, when we do this, we are testing the saccades, the smooth pursuit, optomagnetic test, the gaze and nystagmus test, the positional and positioning test, the caloric response. Videos of eye movements and tracings are recorded and documented. It becomes very important. Even in the later stages, we can see when the patient comes for follow-up and if we repeat it, how much improvement has happened. Next. This is conduction, uh, this is caloric test being performed. Next. This is cervical web. Next. Ocular web. This is video head impulse test. Next. Subjective visual vertical. This is essential to investigate if there is any fault in the auto lens. Next. This is cranial corpography. It's a very simple and quantitative charting of the patient's movements as he performed the classical gait test. Like we were doing, or we have been doing Romberg's, Underberger's, tandem test, but we couldn't quantify them over the years. Now we can quantify the Romberg's, Underberger's, and tandem gait. They are performed, we record and analyze them, and when the patient comes for follow-up, when we see when they come for follow-up, we can see how improvement, how much improvement they have undergone. This is posturography, where computerized static posturography, the most important test we do is escalating sensory denial, which gives us a clear cut idea what part of the balance system is involved. The test is very simple. First, we ask the patient to stand on a hard surface with eyes open. When the person is standing on a hard surface with eyes open, naturally all the systems are contributing. The eyes, the proprioception, and the vestibular labyrinth. When we ask the patient to close the eyes, you have cut off one signal. So we have vestibular system and the proprioception giving us idea. And when we ask the patient to stand on the foam, you have cut off the proprioception. So if the person tends to fall after we have cut off the eye signals and the proprioception, and then the patient tends to fall, it gives us a clear cut idea the patient has got a damaged vestibular labyrinth. Next. This is fantastic. This is something very new. I got this recently installed in my clinic maybe six months ago. This is functional head impulse test which gives me a clear idea of which semicircular canal is functioning and which is not. And the amount of dysfunction the canal has got. So we can study the left anterior, right anterior, left horizontal, right <coughs> horizontal, left posterior, right posterior. This is how the test is done. This is the equipment which is fitted on the head and we do this functional head impulse test. We can easily come to know if the patient has got a damaged sensor fever canal, an individual precise diagnosis can be done. Electrocochleography, we do it for patients of Meniere's disease to assess how much loss the patient has got. Next, brainstem evoke response audiometry. We do this for retrocochlear lesions. Next, this is added information we need in our patients of vertigo where we do the impedance audiometry and the autoacoustic emission. So friends, specific 
test for each anatomical part are available right now. Whatever be the test, there is nothing to be to thorough history taking, a proper clinical examination and the clinical clinician's clinical judgment. All vestibulometric tests are only as good as the man behind the machine and the clinician who is interpreting the test. Next. A word about cervicogenic vertigo. I was having a word with the faculty members here. Over the years, we have been blaming the cervical spine as a cause for vertigo. Even that is known even for the common man. So that has been happening over the years. Why did it happen over the years? Next. Friends, patients presenting with dizziness wearing cervical collars is a common happening in everybody's clinic. Cervical collar laudele, apne vichar kaya hai, to chakkar hai, to laudele. Okay. If we look at the age group, 5 to 20 years, 0% zero patient, zero, zero of patients come with cervical collars. 20 to 40, 28%. 40 to 60, 64%. 60 to 80, almost 85%. Next. The usual story is the patient gets vertigo, which is enhanced on neck movements. The GP advises cervical spine X-ray and you see spondylitis. It is always seen. I was uh, having a word with an orthopedic surgeon right now, and he was telling me it is common spine. Spondylitis will always be directed to X-ray. Referred to an orthopedic surgeon, cervical collar fitted, diagnosis cervical vertigo. Vertigo due to cervical spondylitis. Next. This is the hypothesis which was thought over the years. The cervical spondylitis causes compression of vertebral arteries, which leads to hypoxia in the brain stem, vertebral basilar insufficiency, and causes vertigo. The second hypothesis was osteophytes in the cervical spondylitis press upon the sympathetic plexus over the vertebral artery on head movements. Yes, there is an entity known as Barrelio syndrome. But what is the incidence of this Barrelio syndrome? One in one lakh, one in two lakhs. That is the incidence. But we see cervical collars fitted for the vertigo day in and out. Next. Scientific studies have been done on n number of patients. A transclinear doctor study shows the head rotation does not cause any change in blood flow in vertebral or basilar arteries. Doesn't cause any change. Cervical spondylitis occurs between C3 to C7, cervical vertebrae, and head rotation takes place at C1 and C2 level. So this is basic. So head rotation should not compress any vertebral arteries. Next. Radiological evidence of cervical spondylitis is found in 65% of subjects above 50 years. It is natural degeneration process. In patients about 65 years, 90% of the males and 70% of females have radiological evidence of spondylitis. So if I have a type and if I go to some person and if I get my X-ray done, he will always tell me it is spondylitis causing vertigo. Friends, vertigo and instability common in subjects about 50 years and very common in subjects about 60 years. Why it is so? Why is vertigo is common about the age of 50? If we look at the natural anatomy, we know the nerve cells in the vestibular labyrinth are diminished by 40% at the age of 40 to 50. So if we have 100 <coughs> neurons in the vestibular nuclei and the cells, almost 40 are gone by the age of 40 to 50. So we are depleted of these so many neurons. So naturally, there will be some amount of disability we all will have after the age of 50 or 60. So this is natural. This does not mean that spondylitis is the cause of vertigo. So the common complaint is suspected cervical vertigo is vertigo that increases on rotating head. What is the basic cause if the person has got vertigo on rotation of head? It is generally because of a peripheral vestibulopathy. We have understood, we took the example of fixation of vision and when we move the head, there will be movement of fluid in the semicircular canals and that will cause cupular stimulation. So if there is anything wrong in any of the labyrinths, the patient will always perceive vertigo on head motion 
poor vestibular ocular reflex, vestibular migraine causes so much of head movement, what I go, BPP. So friends, what I go on head rotation is not necessarily due to cervical spondylitis. There is an entity which I have already mentioned, rotational vertebral RT occlusion syndrome, also known as Bowhunter syndrome. Next. Then we come to the basic of vertigo management. How do we go about managing our patients of vertigo? We have come to a diagnosis, we have gone through all the investigations, and now we have a diagnosis. Next. It is based on these principles. Diagnose the cause, not merely suppress the symptoms. Restore normalcy to the DNA balance function by promoting vestibular compensation through physical therapy. Improve the neuronal metabolism, cognition, and correct any concomitant psychological disorder. Provide symptomatic relief with anti vertigo and anti emetic drugs. Again, the same slide, just to give you a glimpse, ki, we have to know everything about the top six because they constitute almost 92% of our OPD. Vestibular migraine is the first. Next. We all need to know. After we have diagnosed that this is vestibular migraine, how to manage acute episode and how to prevent recurrent episodes. Acute episode we have been all have been managing migraine. Acute episode we manage the control of vertigo by prolocal parazine, diamond adenine, cinarizin combination, magnesium and probenzene. Again, nowadays this combination has to take. This has become very. Uh, very much available and we are we all are very fond of the scenarism plus diamond hydrate. If it is associated with headaches, we manage it with the triptans or the analgesics of our choice, <coughs> maybe naproxen or paracetamol. Next. To prevent recurrent episodes, we resort <coughs> beta blockers, the calcium channel blocker, flunarizin, antidepressants like amitriptyline anti convulsants like topiramate and divalproid sodium. Next. Along with all the medical therapy, <coughs> we combine it with physiotherapy to reduce the discomfort which is caused by head and visual motion. We need to give them vestibular rehabilitation all these patients. Next. These drugs, these medicines are helping all our patients nowadays. Supplements like riboflavin, magnesium, vitamin B3, and coenzyme q have become very essential in management of migraine. Next. Meniere's disease, a big chunk of our OPD. Next. We have to diagnose it. We all know it is a triad of symptoms. Vertigo with hearing loss and tinnitus. Next. The radiological diagnosis is now in vogue. It has been mentioned over the years that we do a delayed MRI after intratympanic or IV infection of gadolinium, but the modern MRI machines, without the help of contrast also, we can easily diagnose meniers with uh, the modern MRI machines. Next. The symptomatic treatment in acute stage will be again managing the uh, vertigo part and the vomiting part. So we resort to propylor perazine, diamond hydrogenate, domperidon, all the drugs which we all know. Next. The main stay of treatment is diuretics in many years. The drugs which are available are acetazolamide, triamterin, hydrochlorothiazide, and spironolactone. My drug of choice has been spironolactone. And if the patient is not tolerating, I go to Dimox or acetazolamide. The literature has n number of references about cinarism and beta histine, which is being used. There have been studies in the past where the dosage of beta histine has been thought about. There are studies where even 14 milligrams thrice a day has been given to a patient and it is supposed to have improvement in venous disease. Next. This is the common uh, thing which we keep on telling our patients. Reduce common salt, avoid stress, avoid coffee, alcohol, smoking, and tobacco. Next. Nowadays, 
in the last four or five years, intratympanic therapy has been involved. It has been proved beyond doubt. It helps all patients of many years. We have been trying this. I am a big, big fan of intratympanic therapy. I have been doing this for so many years. Injection dexamethasone or injection methylprednisolone can be given. Along with it, we give intratympanic gentamicin. It is proved, it has been proved, gentamicin proves much better in controlling volatile than steroids. We have been thinking about this, if we give gentamicin, the urine will go down. But then, gentamicin is more vestibular toxic than autotoxic. Streptomycin is more autotoxic than vestibular toxic. So we have advantage of using gentamicin on this. And then it is a recommended treatment for tumor kills autolithic crisis for or drop attacks in mean years. So this is a recent paper by Timothy Hay, where a big study was published about intratympanic gentamicin. Next. This is how we inject gentamicin into, through the tympanic membrane. It's a OPD procedure for me. How we go about? The patient is lying in the spine position. We turn the ear to, and to her. And then we, I apply a small drop of phenol on the side where I want to inject. So phenol, what it does is it anesthetizes that spot. Plus, because of the effect of a cautery, it will also blanch, have a blanching effect. So there is no pain when I inject this intratympanic medicines. Next. Very, very rare nowadays to have a surgery for meniers because intratympanic is very much in vogue and it is helping almost all patients. In the lymphatic sac surgery, when we were uh, in our PG days, we saw Tepensir do a lot of interlymphatic sac surgeries, creating shunts and fistulas. But nowadays we have a better alternative of selective vestibular neurectomies. Next. This is something we all should know, how to diagnose BPP. Had we had a table here, I would have showed you how important it is for all of us. Anyway, clinicians, before we label a person as having BPP, it is mandatory for all of us to do a Dix Holpike test. So this Dix Holpike test, along with macular pagnini test and head angling test, will give us a differentiation of whether the patient is having a posterior canal BPP, lateral canal BPP, or anterior canal BPP. When we do, do these maneuvers, we note what type of nystagmus the patient is getting and what type of vertigo the patient is having. So history is important. Generally, the patient will tell us, Kimi, if it's a lady, she will tell you, Kimi, Kapatarna Vartu Kaitin Kadhai Ragele, Anima Mala Chakkariyate, Kiva Ami Farshiva Kaitin Padla Utate Ghaila Utsal, Gele Anima Mala Chakkariyate. So this is because we saw what is the physics and what is pathophysiology of BPP. The semicircular canals become gravity sensitive once the autoconia from the ureter come into the semicircular canals. And when we change the position, it stimulates and causes vertigo. So it is a classical rotatory vertigo which lasts for a few seconds to minutes, occasionally associated with nausea, vomiting, and sweating. The diagnosis is confirmed by the Solvite test, the macular pagnini test, and the head hanging test. Next. These are the basic three types. The posterior canal, posterior semicircular canal BPPV, the horizontal semicircular canal BPPV, and the anterior canal BPPV. And turn on one side. So when the patient turns completely on one side, 
he supports his head by putting the hand below. This is looking for lateral canal BPP. This is macular pagnitis. So it is so simple. We make the patient turn on one side. If you see, look at the eyes with the frenzels goggles. If there is nystagmus and the patient is telling you it is vertigo, he has vertigo, it is that type of BPP. If you turn the patient on the other side, and if he develops vertigo and you see nystagmus, it can be left-sided lateral canal BPP. Now, we are looking for the most commonest cause of BPP, that is posterior semicircular canal BPP. Make the patient sit like this, turn the head 45 degrees. Okay? Make him look at an object or a finger, wait for 30 seconds. Now hold the head, Padna Nehra. Put the head down over the table, hang the head 45 degrees and look for vertigo. If the patient is giving you a history of vertigo, uh, if the patient is sensing any vertigo or if you can see any nystagmus. If you see nystagmus and if the patient has vertigo, it is right sided posterior semicircular canal BPP. Repeat the same test on the other side. If you get vertigo, if you get nystagmus, it is left sided posterior canal BPP. And if you ask the patient to lie down, hang the head, if the patient is complaining of vertigo and you see nystagmus, it is anterior canal BPP. Why should any clinician miss this? Nobody should afford to miss this. It is so simple to do this. Thank you. So these three tests, if we conduct, we can easily, all of us, diagnose BPP. And once we have diagnosed this, we have maneuvers to reset the autoconia which have gone into that canal. We bring them back to the utricle. And once it goes to the home, home autoconia need to go back to the utricle. And once they go to the utricle, the BPPV is treated. There is no medical treatment for BPPV. How much ever drugs you give? One drug, two drugs, three drugs, injection, whatever you give. The vertigo will still be there in BPPV. Next. So diagnosed by the test. Next. Medical management has no role. Careful history and clinical examination is essential. Repositioning maneuvers, if performed correctly, give instant relief. Why this sentence becomes very important. I have seen patients undergoing a place maneuver for BPPV of all types. Whatever the type of BPPV is, patients are undergoing a place maneuver. This is commonly happening nowadays. There are <coughs> some individuals, some clinicians who are aware of a place maneuver. <coughs> and the YouTube has got so many videos showing how to do a place maneuver. But then it so happens, if it is a BPPV of the lateral canal and if you do a place maneuver, you are creating a different type of complicated BPPV because you are put, pushing the autoconia to a different canal. And then we are, we are blaming the place maneuver kit is not treating the patient. We have to be very categorical in first diagnosing the type of BPPV and then have the correct maneuver to correct it. Vitamin D3 is also very important. Next. Vestibular neuritis. Yes, it's a big chunk of patients which come to us. Next. It could be, <coughs> it is generally unilateral vestibular failure associated with nausea or vomiting. A generally a hospitalized patient who's been having over time for two days, three days. <coughs> there is no hearing loss, there is no tinnitus. Visual vertigo may be a complaint when we move the head, the patient perceives vertigo, generally in adults, not in pediatric patients. There could be a difficulty in walking and it can be preceded by flu-like symptoms because we believe vestibular neuritis is a viral illness. Steroids are the mainstay of treatment in vestibular neuritis. Now it so happens ki these patients commonly go to some clinician and they have not received steroids. They have received only drugs which can treat vertigo. 
which can subside the blood time, but it, it is not treated properly. So these patients continue to have an uncompensated state, uncompensated state, because they will have perception of vertigo even later part of the life. <clears throat> People have received acyclovir, but there is absolutely no role right now. <clears throat> Similar rehabilitation exercises have a big role to play. Next. Yes, this is something which we need to know about. What is persistent perceptual postural dizziness? These are practically patients created by us clinicians. <clears throat> After an episode of vertigo of any origin, there is a feeling of continuous movement or dizziness in these patients. They believe that they are unsteady for a long period of time and there is light headedness. It stays for hours to days in sitting, standing, and they are mostly afraid of going to crowded places. Why they are afraid to go into crowded? Because there are so many movements happening around. If they go to a shopping mall, generally in a shopping mall you see so many neon lights flashing here and there advertisement boards and so many things. So this makes them more unsteady. This was first described in 2015 and the incidence is almost one in four. So all of us, we have to be aware of this condition and how to treat this. <coughs> Friends, it's a vicious cycle. These patients always worry about fall. So they pay more attention. So brain is always on high alert, I don't want to fall, I don't want to fall. So they are constantly worried. It relies more on visual inputs. So they will have more inputs coming from the eyes. They will constantly keep on staring at things. And busy patterns and continuous movements around them make them more busy. So this is a typical theory. <coughs> Next. How do we rehabilitate these patients? We have so many we have, uh, 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 therapies for this. CBT also is, uh, is recommended, cognitive behavioral therapy, physiotherapy, we have virtual reality helping these patients. As medication, most of these patients respond to escitalopram, venlafaxin, desvenlafaxin, and amitriptyline. So these are the drugs which we commonly prescribe to these patients. Next. Vestibular paroxysmia is a very rare condition which responds mostly to carbamazepine. Next. Epileptic vertigo again responds to anti-epileptic drugs. Next. We need to know something about vestibular compensation. Next. Friends, it's a natural process of the brain which helps the body overcome the feeling of vertigo. It takes place mainly at the vestibular nuclear level and which receives inputs from the two ears from both the sides. It is a nature's way to combat peripheral vestibular disorders. Next. In a broad term, for, for the overall behavioral and functional recovery of the patient, this compensation takes place. We all know the vestibular labyrinth is connected to the hypothalamus. We know it is connected to the limbic system. We know it is connected to the spinal columns. So vestibular system has connections to all parts of the brain and spinal column and so many other things. Vestibular rehabilitation therapy is the mainstay of treatment in all patients of vestibular disorders. This is Baroness Society giving us all the guidelines. It is defined as a form of physical therapy recommended for vertigo which uses specialized exercises to regain gaze and gaze stabilization. In combination with pharmacology treatment, it has been proved useful in managing vestibular or central balance dysfunctions. Next. We have been seeing <coughs> leaflets distributed by pharmacological companies mentioning so many exercises. But beyond this, there are so many other exercises which have been devised for particular situation. Next. This is what we have been seeing over the days, adaptation exercises. Yes, next. The compensation. Next. These are the habituation exercises. Next. Oh. 
So these are targeted rehabilitation therapies which are available now. It's a big video. I'm just skipping it next. We come to the end of my presentation. I'm just concluding with the next three or four slides. And if time permits and if you have, I'll show you one, one or two videos, which will be not more than three or four minutes. This is today's scenario. Anti-vertigo drugs given for months and years together to suppress vertigo is a common happening. Most of these drugs are CNS depressants. All of them are CNS depressants. They depress the activity of the brain that results in inadequate compensation. I can narrate your story. Professor Harman Kima, he is a Nobel laureate and he is a neurologist. I was listening to his presentation in Jaipur. Imagine what he was telling us can be imagined in our situation also. Dhargao, अतः धुरे जिल्ला के अंदर बार क्या भागा हो गया है अन्य आदिवासी जिल्ला है हाथ से मेडिकल प्रैक्टिशनर्स इतने ना ही हैं इवन जनरल प्रैक्टिशनर्स नस्ता नाउ व्हाट हैपेंस इतने एक हरे पेशेंट ला जो वेस्टिबुलर न्यूरोटिस दाल या पेशेंट ला स्टेमिटल पर कोई दिले लेना ही है सिनेरिज्म दिले लेना will develop compensation very fast. Why? Because his body, his brain will now take care of the function which is lost on one side. Imagine, imagine a situation where 100 neurons are there on both the sides and if because of the viral infection 10 neurons are fired. Now the body has got 90 on one side, 100 on the other side. What the brain does is because of the neuroplasticity. We all know this, neuroplasticity exists in the neuronal system. And there is the remodeling of the nerve tissues and everything that goes on. And then that compensation which happens without any drug intervention happens very fast and it is long lasting. And imagine a patient who has had a vertigo with vestibular neuritis coming to a doctor within few hours and receives all drugs. Now all these drugs will give a situation where compensation is being delayed. There are clinicians, I will tell you so many examples. I, I saw a patient recently. This lady is a skin specialist, she is a doctor. And the doctor who attended her told her to stay indoors. Room is this is perfect recipe for poor compensation. The patient is not up, not moving, there is no illumination, there is all, everything which is causing poor compensation. So the patient has to be up, moving very fast. Only then we can stimulate compensation. We find the result is an uncompensated patient with persistent instability. Dependence, what we talked about. How should the ghetatas and ghetatas and they become dependent. The dependence is so much because they, they, they feel they are steady only when they consume one day. They will consume scenarism. Goya, it can have a task that it holds the head motion that keep a constimated factor for that. So this is the situation right now. And these patients become very <coughs> difficult to treat. It is sometimes even impossible to restore and normalize balance function in these uncompensated patients. Next. Friends, vertigo is a symptom. It is not a disease. The underlying cause needs to be ascertained by proper history taking meticulous clinical examination and investigations. There is no blanket therapy for vertigo. By that I mean, for vestibular migraine, we have got a specific therapy, menial specific therapy. Vestibular neuritis specific therapy, labyrinthitis specific therapy, stroke specific therapy. None of these diagnoses which we saw, we found there was no role of all the drugs which we have been prescribing over the years. So there is a specific treatment pattern for all these things. We have different types of medicines and therapies for different types of illnesses depending upon the nature of pathology. Unfortunately, the common trend to treat patients of vertigo by so-called anti-vertigo drugs 
is like treating typhoid fever with paracetamol. <coughs> For any fever, we investigate, we find whether it is dengue, malaria, and so many other causes, but we don't keep on treating fever with paracetamol. Next. These drugs jeopardize the central compensatory mechanism. Peripheral vestibular disorders are usually self-limiting. I have already narrated the Harman Kima story. Next. Vertigo imbalance is just a symptom or manifestation of an underlying disorder. The causative pathology needs to be known. Symptomatic treatment with anti nitro drugs will relieve symptoms but not cure the causative cause. Next. We have to correct the cause, not merely suppress the symptoms. Vertigo imbalance and psychogenic disorders are comorbid conditions. This is what is happening when we keep on prescribing anti drugs. They become dependent, they become, they are worrisome patients. Next. Medical management is necessary in acute episode. Judicious use of proper drug is needed with caution and restraint. Next. We come back to the questions which we asked before the presentation. Let me see whether we have found the answers. Next. Patient of World Diego is brought to us in our office. What should be our approach? <coughs> We need to think about it. After this presentation, what should be our approach? We use anti drugs to stop vertigo. Do we need to prescribe one, two, three at the same time? Is it required to use combinations? Vertigo is a symptom. We need to find the cause. We have understood, yes, we need to find the cause. Next. All patients with vertigo with head movements, are, is it always BPPD? No, we have found so many reasons where so many etiologists can cause vertigo with head movements. Long term prescription of anti vertigo drugs and self medication later is a common observation. Yes. Is this responsible or dependence? Very much. Why is vertigo recurrent in some patients and not in few? Again, a very simple example for this. I can tell you if there are Lahanda Mulasta, the gymnastics karta, Malkham karta, Lahan Pranapasna sports madhyasta. Now, if this child later on develops vestibular neuritis, this child will develop compensation very fast because his brain has already got signals how to stabilize even in difficult situations. So people who are in sports activities and doing complex activities, if they develop vertigo in the later part of life, they are much, they will really, they will live much faster. So these are the patients for a pretty long time and they don't get treated very fast. Treatment with popular medicine, does it cure vertigo? A big no. It will never cure vertigo, it will only give symptomatic relief. Next. Our investigations of help, yes, we have got investigations which help us in making a precise diagnosis topographical and etiological diagnosis. Now, if a, make, if a friend makes a phone call, naturally you'll have to think what you are going to tell the friend. We do contribute by way of not attending these patients and fear, anxiety and panic sets in these patients. Do our patients of what type of deserve more than what they are offered to do? Yes, give them time. Listen to them. They are eager to tell you something. My experience for the last 15 years tells me ki, they keep on telling me ki, you are the first doctor who has heard me. This is what they tell me. Yes, they tell me ki, tu doctor ha, ki tu aikale se te there are, we have got, I, I, I agree with all of you, you have patients being seen like Panna Saad, Sattara, Aisha patient Bagai Chayos, so you don't have time to, to attend these patients. Do we all understand in a port vertigo? No. The scientists, researchers are still groping in dark with so many situations of vertigo. We have no answer to them. But then we have come at least to some diagnosis, like 15 or 20 diagnoses which we have, which we can manage. Next. What is in store for us tomorrow? We consider about yesterday, we talked about today. Tomorrow definitely holds much promise. We have Dr. Milen Navlaki here, who is doing so many implants. So he will be one person who will be doing vestibular implants in the near future. Next. 
So the take home message is loud and clear. Proper history taking, meticulous clinical examination, judicial investigations interpreted in the light of history and clinical examination gives us a definitive diagnosis. We can target specific drug therapy in these patients. This is the most rational approach for treating patients of what I go to do. Next. A big thank you from my staff and my hospital. This is my place where I work. If you permit me, I'll show you a very grateful, gratifying video.
was surprised ki how he came from Bareilly to Dhudia and then he narrated me the story ki on YouTube he saw my videos and uh, I have a big presentation on Timarkin's autolithic crisis once I started giving intratimbaric gentamicin. So we have quite a few patients of end stage engineers who have prop attacks and they have benefited with uh, gentamicin. And he was very categorical in mentioning that now he is free of his drop attacks, which is a very big thing to happen because these people used to fall down. There was a lady from Amarne, there is a patient in from Julia, Nandurba. There are so many patients of meniers who have received gentamicin and they are symptom free. And most of these patients, now this gentleman is only on aldactone. <coughs> that is the only medicine, that to half tablet. Almost we prescribe 25, uh, the physician friends can tell me they will be prescribing more than 25 milligrams in indications. But these patients are all meniers patients are on 12.5 milligrams of aldactone, the only drug. There are no antivertigo drugs with it, no synarizin, no fluorarizin, no vertin, nothing. So this is uh, one of the patients who came from a very long distance, he never knew where Dure is and he just happened to be there looking for me and then he asked a few patients and now he's very happy. So this is about what I hope. So thank you very much for giving me your patience. Thank you very much, sir. Now I would like to request our past president, Dr. Nahata, sir, to please felicitate our speaker, Dr. Charuhas Jagdap, with Momento and Sash. Thank you so much sharing your valuable insights. I'm very proud to tell you, friends, the largest number of reference I have had in the last 15 years is from none other than Bhusawar. And my biggest fan is Dr. Vikas Kolambe. And the trust which he has shown in the last 15 years is amazing. I see at least two patients every month which, are, which come from Bhusawar and he has patients from Barangpur and all these places. And I'm surprised if the way he convinces them and sends them across to Dure and all these patients are doing well, he can tell the stories about all these patients. <laughs> there is one funny incident which happens with one patient of Dr. Kolombe. So, Madrasi fellow, they say, puncture repair karthat. Now, this fellow came from uh, Dr. Gusabha. Now, this patient tells me ki, जब भी मुझे चक्कर आता है तो वो दो घंटा रहता है मचलाट होती उल्टी होती है और फिर वो बंद हो जाता है ही हैड मेनियर्स वी गेव हिम ऑल द ट्रीटमेंट वी गेव हिम जेंटामाइसिन सो आई यूज्ड टू आस्क हिम कि व्हेनेवर यू गेट व्हाट आई नाउ ही प्ले ही स्टेज इन अ रिमोट प्लेस रास्ते और हाईवे और कोटे के लिए ऐसा शॉप है सो मेडिकल हेल्प इज नॉट अवेलेबल एवरी टाइम व्हेन ही गेट्स एन एक्यूट अटैक so I asked him once कि तूने चक्कर एक भैया आपको चक्कर आ गई तो आप क्या करते हो? He tells me कि I find the lock मैं वक्त कुलुप शब्द तो मिले पे है। मतलब what do you do with the lock? मैं मेरे वर्कशॉप गैरेज के बाहर बाहर जाता हूँ बाहर से लॉक लगाता हूँ पीछे से अंदर आता हूँ सो जाता हूँ दो घंटे के बाद उठता हूँ बाहर जाता हूँ लॉक खोलता हूँ काम के � this is just to narrate ki he is not fond of stimulant. He is not fond of any drug. He will not pick up any drug from the house and take it and to stop the overtime. He understood what he has, but now he is symptom free. So it is my proud privilege to invite Dr. Kolumbe here. And uh, I would like to felicitate him. faith which uh, all my colleagues are showing in me. There are n number, n number of neurologists, n number of physicians, 
any number of general practitioners in and around. And I have been lucky in a way he, I have been trusted by so many and these patients are doing well. Thank you very much. As we conclude, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed guest, speaker and participants for making the event successful. I offer my sincere thanks to our speaker, Dr. Jagta. I would like to thank our IMA Vice President, Dr. Gajri Sir, for his valuable presence and guidance. I exchange my gratitude to IMA AMS Vice President, Dr. Vilas Boy for his continuous guidance. I also express my thanks to Dr. Anita Boy, Secretary IMA Jalga, for arranging this CME and working hard for its event execution. I also express my deepest gratitude to our wonderful audience for their, their participation and engagement, which has made this event truly special. As we conclude this event, let us show our gratitude upon those who made it a huge success by their untiring efforts. Uh, our support pillars, IMS Mr. Sonar and Mr. Bari, photographing. I also thank Silver Palace staff for their service and support. Thank you all. After this great academic feast, I request all of you to relax and unwind uh, with us over dinner after an exciting speech. Thank you again. If anyone has any question, they can ask Dr. Jaktaus.